So I first like to recognize the gift of presence and that in holding this sacred space for this gathering today, we recognize that we were here. We're grateful that we're still here and we are committed to contributing while we are here. In order to do that, the principle of Sankofa, which is a Ghanaian word, teaches us that it is not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten. So the question we raise is, what is it that we have forgotten? Well, our history books sometimes tell a different story than that which could best inform our understanding of race, work, leadership, management practices, division of labor, and fueling the US economy. <coughs> the Atlantic slave trade did not bring millions of workers to work on <coughs> agricultural plantations. Instead, we might think of our history in this way. We had a dream that one day our sons and daughters would grow up to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, preachers, politicians, and business owners. Business owners? Yes, business owners with a capital B because back in the day we were the capital. See? Bought and sold per pound of flesh, tried and tested under great duress. The great race started with a gunshot. Bang. Sprinting to the finish line before the closing bell rang. This land is our land, plowed by a sacred hand and claimed through a courageous stand. There are a number of ways that we can think about the links between race, work, leadership, the black experience using the lens of capital. We might think about the ways in which capital was exploited. We might think about dehumanizing capital, though many of us teach now about how to value human capital. What does it mean to think about laborers as only physical capital? and to systematically deprive them of the opportunity to develop other forms of capital, such as social capital, such as intellectual capital, prohibiting them from reading, prohibiting them from convening, prohibiting them from gathering. And when they create it, that those innovations that we would now call total quality management and process innovations, you know, how to rotate crops, to produce the greatest yield, that those two, as forms of brilliance, were not valued at a point in our own history. Tina Opie and I published a piece a few months ago, uh, Do Black Lives Really Matter in the Workplace, using a restorative justice framework. And in that, we talk about some of the links between the valuation of capital and management principles. Um, but you can see here that uh, the contributions were immense, uh, though hugely depleting. What's also interesting to note is that field experiments began on plantations. Scientific management was the practice of identifying and measuring the quantity, the rate, and the quality of workers' productivity on a daily basis. So I've spent a lot of time at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And so viewing the threads from those exhibits, I encourage you to take a visit if you haven't already, because it is not wrong to look back, to reach back, to gather that which we have forgotten, or what I would say in our spaces in business schools, that which is often undiscussable. And note the ways in which workers' productivity was measured in terms of efficiency. Diets were regulated to increase profitability and yield. Span of control was increased through forced reproduction. Power imbalances were maintained by preserving and developing certain cultural practices, 
around authority and dehumanization. And middle management, forms of middle management were implemented, not in the 1940s or 50s, but actually centuries before. But there was also some liberation. And that, too, was part of the story of learning about and from black experience, that even in those spaces that we see how enslaved Africans were committed to accruing, investing, and leveraging their capital in service of liberation. Sometimes that involved outsmarting the system, putting a rock at the bottom of your bag of cotton so that it would weigh heavier when you put it on the scale, outsmarting the system. Entrepreneurial gigs, there were certain plantation owners that provided, quote unquote, opportunities for hustles and side gigs, often in the forms of entertainment, but sometimes in terms of artisanship and crafting. Black institutions were formed as ways of subverting the oppression of social capital, promoting the institution of bonds and connectivity, such as marriage, such as religious bonds in church, even though those types of bonds were developed in covert ways. And over the past 100, 150 years, we've also pursued liberation through leveraging our buying power. The Montgomery bus boycott was, in fact, a boycott of a business. W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard. Did you know that the title of his dissertation was The Suppression of the African Slave Trade in the United States of America from 1638 to 1870? Did you know that he was the first social scientist who systematically gathered data on the demographics of Africans formerly enslaved and then emancipated? Did you know he conducted regional studies in Philadelphia as well as in Atlanta, actually statewide studies? His first book was called The Philadelphia Negro, where he documented trends in buying power, in education, in housing, to really understand the capital and the resources that people of African descent offered to this country. But did you know that by the beginning of the 20th century, he became cynical? about race research, about the kind of data that he developed, which essentially founded sociological research and practices, although it was 100 years before he was credited for doing so, that at one point in time when he was at the Atlanta University Center, he said one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. And I wonder how many in this room have asked that question in light of Black Lives Matter and many other things that have happened in recent years. Now, Booker T. Washington was the first African American to earn it, to receive an honorary doctorate from Harvard University. And that was just a couple of years after W.B. Du Bois graduated. And as you, as you may know, their schools of thought were differing. But they both created space for conversations around commerce, race, work, leadership. Booker T. Washington published a book, The Negro in Business. He also founded the National Negro Business League in the early 1900s. So one thing that I didn't mention in setting up this conference last year, we had a pre-conference before the Gender and Work Conference, where a group of race researchers, there were about 20, 30 of us, um, we gathered to collectively plan the agenda for this conference this year. What would it mean for us to talk about this conversation for two days? What are the kinds of questions that will come up? What might we focus on? We opened with an exercise that invited us to consider key moments in history. What was happening in the world? What was happening in terms of the scholarship, scholarly focus on race? And at that same time, what was happening in the scholarly focus on management? 
Now, obviously, I am not going to go through 100 plus years in five minutes. But I'll just point out a couple of highlights because they're interesting um, in terms of looking at some of the trends. In race research in the early 1900s, uh, respectability, politics on the part of black scholars, but also research on the content of stereotypes and reifying stereotypes. Um, in management, trying to understand labor protests, so that give and take between Taylorism and employee engagement and more humanizing work practices. You know, at the same time, new organizational forms were coming into being because of the emancipation of enslaved Africans. Harlem Renaissance, I'm gonna go pretty quickly now. Um, other 1940s, the Clark Doll study, how that affected the movement toward integrating schools, how those data were used um, to try to promote equal access and equal opportunity in the 1950s. Uh, but in management, the conversations were about more about depersonalization. It doesn't really matter who you are. Let's focus on bureaucracy. Let's focus on roles. Let's focus on operations. You know, because the human stuff, oh, that's, you know, that's getting complicated and messy. But A. Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters said, no, we're still going to take advantage of our human capital. You rely on us. We will have sway and influence over commerce. Okay. Other interesting headlines I wanted to share with you as we're here at Harvard Business School. What was Harvard Business Review publishing? in the mid 20th century around race and around the black experience. Here are some of the conversations. Consumer motivations in black and white. Business, the next target for integration. ASU was founded in 1968 and with that, you started to have a flurry because of this critical point in history of also articles around and insights and questions around how this movement would affect management studies and management practice. Black enterprises, limits of black capitalism. So all that to say this is not a new conversation. It's not a new conversation, but in making it figure rather than ground, you know, when I look at this conversation in 1976, this article published by John Johnson, failure is a word I don't accept, reminds me of the piece that we just published about senior black women executives and resilience. You know, some of these themes have been with us for a while, but if race is not figure, if race is always ground, we're not able to connect the dots. So every experience feels like a new pressing set of crises rather than a set of challenges that we've probed and perhaps that we can help to address. I'm gonna bring you now into the late 20th century where many of the people in this room were in grad school. <laughs> and starting in the 90s, we started to think about diversity and increasing the representation of people <laughs> of color in the workforce. And because of that, we also started to bring diversity into more central conversations within management and to become more nuanced around theories of identity, biculturalism, code switching, so forth. Because the dominant question in the 80s was how to assimilate. But in the 90s, we started asking how do we take charge? And that was a shift. And what do we see in the 90s? We see Cox and Blake. Hi, Blake. In 1991, this is where I get to give a few shout outs. Um, in 1991, diversity as a resource. We see 1996, Thomas and Ely making differences matter. How do we break through? How do we get ahead? The making of minority executives. And then Roosevelt Thomas, who was one of the first graduates of the doctoral program here at Harvard Business School, also was a leading thinker within this space and raised a lot of questions about the extent to which we keep race center even in the diversity conversation. So where are we now? 
Here are some of the events of the past 15 years. Affirmative action lawsuits, the Obama presidency, 9-11, anti-immigration, backlash, ancestry testing, Black Lives Matter. How is that affecting the way that we think about race? How does that affect the questions that we bring in the room today, the work that we want to take up for the next couple of days? Let me show just a couple of images to continue to stimulate, and then I'll wrap up. That one says diversity in the initial cabinet members from the past four presidents. Greg Popovich of the San Antonio Spurs. Why do we have to keep talking about race? This is on the steps of Baker Library at Harvard Business School a couple of years ago. Shout out to Courtney, she's at the corner. <laughs> it says, if I had a dollar every time someone asks, if we had a dollar every time someone asks about our hair, we could reduce the race, bill, and gender <laughs> pay gap. They just released Lady Liberty, look at her hair, 2017. Opening tomorrow. And of course, <laughs> so what is our Wakanda? Here's our Wakanda. <laughs> it's David and Ashley <laughs> from the pre-conference last year. Here's our Wakanda, us doing this work, reaching back, constructing the timeline, trying to understand that which we thought that we had lost, but in fact, we had not. And I'll close with a poem, because this feels like the right moment, um, experiment. I wonder what could be if we could erase race and in its place put diversity. I wonder where we go if we could erase race and let our identities freely flow. I wonder what we'd find if we could erase race and obliterate the color line. I wonder what we create. If we could erase race and reclaim our rightful estate. I wonder what we buy. If we could erase race on the auction block. Buy low, sell high. But I wonder what we'd lose if we could erase race Reclaim our right to choose? I wonder what we'd miss if we could erase race. Take away our collective bliss. I wonder what we'd forget if we could erase race. All the memories and upsets. Statutes, systems, structures, pinning us in place. Bonds, bruises, bloodlines, defining our home base. Ancestors, agitators, activists, calling from within. Teachers, preachers, builders, liberating from sin. It's who I am. It's who I be. It's the most undeniable indescribable part of me. The stories I tell, the scars I bear, my treasure chest of gold. If you'd erase my race today, you'd wipe away my soul. Thank you. <laughs>